So um, I'm Laurent, the, the founder of the Paris FinTech Forum, uh, the most exclusive event we have in Europe on FinTech and digital finance. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome today three of the greatest creators of FinTech we have this last two decades. I'm a bit honored and frightened, I must say, but uh, I'm sure we will have a very nice discussion. So first, please, I would let you a few minutes to introduce yourself. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows you, but let's, let's do a refresh. Ron, I let you begin. So first of all, it's great to be here. Singapore literally is my favorite country here in Southeast Asia. And this conference is really amazing. If you didn't believe it was an exciting time to be in FinTech globally, you do now. I spent 20 years on Wall Street working with hedge funds, leverage, trading, risk, and technology. And in 2006, I decided to leave big company, leave Wall Street to become an entrepreneur. My first one, not quite so successful, which we'll talk about. Second one was an interesting one, another fintech solution, helping hedge funds under a billion, backed by Sequoia, big exit to Wells Fargo. And then I wanted to follow this guy and join the online lending, the peer-to-peer -peer industry. So I was able to get involved with Prosper.com. And again, Sequoia invested and had a great uh, four-year run with Prosper. I'm now not employed. I am rewiring and managing my own family office teaching about fintech and innovation around the world and investing in equity and debt deals around the world as well. It's great to be here. Thank you, Ron. Please, Renaud. All right, my name is Ronald Laplanche. Um, so I sort of uh, entered the fintech arena about 10 years ago when um, I founded a company called Landing Club. It was really one of the first uh, peer-to-peer lending platforms in the US together with um, Prosper, and we closely followed the, the, the birth of peer-to-peer -peer lending that, that we started with Zopa in the UK. And uh, the very basic idea of Lending Club was essentially to use technology and a marketplace model to drive costs down and deliver a better experience to consumers online. Um, so I had the idea of Lending Club when uh, I opened a piece of mail and uh, it was a credit card statement and uh, the interest rate I would be paying on my, on my credit card was 18%, which I thought was pretty high, but then the next piece of mail I opened that was another statement from the same bank, but it was my savings account statement, and the interest rate on that was 0.5% on my uh, high yield savings account. And uh, so I was just tr struck by uh, the yield between these two, uh, the spread between these two rates, um, the 18% that the bank would charge you uh, if you were to, uh, to uh, borrow some money, and the 0.5% you would get from the bank to deposit your money, again, at the same bank and at the same money, uh, essentially. Uh, so really the, the sort of marketplace lending um, uh, effort and, and sort of entire industry was really built on that premise of compressing the spread between these two rates and operating uh, more efficiently with better technology to uh, essentially de deliver a lower interest rate to consumers and deliver a better rate of return for savers, depositors, and, and investors. Um, so I left Lending Club after uh, 10 years uh, last year and uh, founded, uh, as you can probably tell from the very uh, discreet uh, piece of clothing, <laughs> a new company called Upgrade um, that is built on a similar model uh, but essentially combines peer-to-peer uh, -peer loans with uh, credit monitoring, credit alerts, and credit education features that really help uh, consumers sort of make better decisions and uh, better manage their credit and eventually get access to lower cost financing. Michael. Great. My name is Michael Stumm. I'm primarily an academic I, uh, in computer science. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I specialized in computer systems, especially large, complex uh, systems. I uh, sort of advise Facebook a little bit or consult with them on how to do back-end infrastructure, how to uh, store all the data and find it and access it quickly. And then over the years, I did several startups. Some of them have failed. Um, at least one of them has been successful. I co-founded a company called Oanda that does currency trading and provides currency information. And at that time, it sort of revolutionized a little bit the currency uh, markets in that it opened up trading for the retail clients. Initially, when we started, 
uh, the minimal trade size was $1 million. It was for very wealthy people or for institutionals primarily. And we immediately went on to the marketing that allowed trading at the same price down to $1, immediate settlement. We had a lot of innovations and sort of changed the markets in quite a bit. And I think I would like to think that we played a little bit of a role in helping bring down the cost of trading by at least a factor of 10 over a few years. So that's my experience. So to make it short, for those of you who don't understand, didn't understood that from their very humble presentation, they just created three of the most important fintech we all discuss about when we try to take models. So that's quite impressive. And just to stay with you, Michael, um, we all have a few gray air here just to be nice. And um, so a lot of experience, let's say it like that. Do you think it is today in 2017 globally in the world easier or, uh, or more difficult to, in your opinion, to build a new fintech venture? It's both, I think, easier and it's also harder. Um, so, on, and that's in general for startups. It's easier because you don't have to do capital investments. You can go onto the cloud immediately. Networking is free. Workspace you can get for a very low cost. So it's very, very easy to enter and become a startup. At the same time, it's harder because whatever idea you have and you think you're going to create a startup, you have to assume there's at least 100 other people working on that problem at exactly the same time, distributed around the world. People in Mumbai, people in Dubai, people in San Francisco, people in Munich or Berlin, they will all, in London, they will all have the same idea. And so you need uh, to be a little bit unique, to be able to differentiate yourself, and you have to be able to run much faster, because if somebody beats you to the market, then it's very difficult to get in. You speak about the competitions market, but what about regulation, for example? When you launched in the 19s, were you really regulated, or you did what you want in your market? I mean, we were very lucky. There was no regulatory. Uh, fr we were lucky. Where there was no regulatory framework at all uh, when we started, and. We uh, although we, we liked regulation and we were uh, welcomed it when it came along, but it does make life -y harder to get in because now you have certain capital requirements depending on the type of business you get into. Because today in your forex business, I mean in many markets, it's highly regulated compared to 20 years ago. That's, that's right. But the regulators recognize that and they're doing better in, for example, Singapore, MAS, they're creating these sandboxes to make life easier for the startups. I think that's a very good uh, way to go. Ron, you wanted to react. Yeah, I, th I think it's totally easier. It's much easier on many, many levels, not just because of open source software and Alley Cloud and AWS Cloud, but I travel the world and talk to entrepreneurs, and I talk about the emotional aspect of being an entrepreneur, the emotional aspect of starting a business and maybe winning and maybe failing. And I think that a lot of people around the world, whether it's Latin America, the Middle East, Europe, North America, or here, we're afraid to be entrepreneurs. We're afraid to start businesses because if you failed, you didn't get a second chance. But now culturally around the world in the entrepreneurial, in the innovative centers, in the startup groups that I talk to, it is easier because if it doesn't work, they can get a second shot. They can always go back to the big incumbent. So in addition to what you said with the technology and the people and the WeWork space and open space, I think emotionally, spirit. culturally, and spiritually, it's easier to be an entrepreneur today. And if you win, you get to win really big now as you see the concentration of wealth with entrepreneurs. Whereas if 20 years ago you were an entrepreneur and it worked, you did well, but now you can do very, very well. If I may, we have a light living example because 10 years ago you built Lending Club and now this year you build Upgrade. Easier, more difficult? Um, so personally, a lot easier. Um, it's just not always easier to do it yeah, second time <laughs> around. Um, but I think for, for any fintech entrepreneur, starting a fintech venture now is a lot easier um, because of you know, the consumer adoption, because the sort of investor market is uh, more receptive to, to it. Um, a lot of companies have been built and have succeeded, uh, so that has drawn a lot, of, a lot more capital to the space. But I think there's something we should also keep in mind, which is uh, economic cycles and credit cycles. I mean, one of the reasons why it's easier is uh, we, at least in the US we, and, and globally, uh, we're, uh, so we've been in this 10-year expansion, almost 10-year expansion cycle. Um, I think when we started Landing Club and, and Prosper, um, it was in 2007, 
which uh, sequentially comes right before 2008. Um, and uh, so we were growing in an environment and, and not really offering to investors a, uh, to participate in an asset class that was consumer credit in an environment that was the worst possible environment for offering consumer credit, where uh, if you, so in an environment where if you open the newspaper or turn on the TV, all you could hear was uh, so people defaulting on their mortgages and, and banks failing all over the country. Um, so, so I think they, uh, we also need to recognize that it's been a good environment that probably isn't going to last forever. I mean, some, some, some aspect of it is going to continue, uh, but there will be an economic slowdown in the next few years. And uh, I think uh, entrepreneurs should be mindful of, of that aspect of, of the cycles and, and prepare for it. So in the same time, we speak of uh, easier and be careful. So that leads me to a second question, which is at the end of the 90s, we had a bubble. Everybody knows that. Not only the problem in 2007, but I think in 2000 and 2001 was a great one. And at this time, we had already fintechs. We had already fintech valued billion who evaluate zero after. And recently, in newspapers over the last uh, few months, we can read, is there a fintech bubble? We see some valuation very high, and when you look at the figures of the real business, they are like non-existent or very low. So do you think uh, uh, we have today this, um, this risk of bubble or wrong? What's your opinion on that? So if you go to a search engine and type in the hype cycle, you'll see a picture of the hype cycle, and it goes up, it comes down, it looks like it's never gonna go up again, and then it goes back up again in a different unique way. And if you're old enough to remember the mid-90s, the late-90s, the beginning of something called FOMO, the fear of missing out. Were you gonna miss out on Netscape or Pets.com or some of these companies that had no chance of generating cash and zero chance of generating earnings or EBITDA, but you wanted to be in it and the hype cycle was there, and it went up like crazy, and it came down overnight, over two nights. It was such a burst and a crash of the late 90s and early 2000s. And I think what we've seen is a different kind of hype cycle this last 10 years. Yes, there was some FOMO, some fear of missing out of some of the high growth companies. You saw in Asia, 3,000 online lenders across consumer and SME some brand new who never knew about credit or never knew about entrepreneurship and tech. You had some offline players wanting to become online. So there literally were online lenders starting up overnight, going into villages, banging on gongs, getting people to come to borrow and lend with very little credit and technology. In the US, it was kind of the same thing. If you started up a wedding loan or business loan or franchise loan, consumer loan, business, student, mortgage, you get the idea, you could get valuations of 10 and 12 and 20 times last month's origination from institutions and mutual funds and venture. So you didn't see the same kind of pop or same kind of decline in the hype cycle. It was slower. The herd was culled. So you now have 200 online lenders in Asia and maybe 75 going to 50 in the US. So you've seen a slower decline, lots of these online lenders not being able to meet the new regulatory requirements, not being able to raise equity capital to make payroll, or debt capital to feed the balance sheet, or people in the peer-to-peer -peer model. So we've seen a slower decline, a slower culling of the herd, but an important one. So is it, there is no bubble crack, but just a soft cleaning. And it's not over yet. So there's more cleansing that's gonna happen. There will be more platforms that merge or fail or sell. And you're starting to see it. There was one in the paper yesterday in the US who sold its assets to another. So my point is, it is an exciting time. The stronger are stronger, but the cleansing has been slower and less of a big crash so far. Opinion on that? I, th I think that's right. Uh, generally, we've seen more discipline, and it's a pretty sort of healthy cleansing process that has been gradual and hasn't been uh, really a, a crash. Uh, but again, uh, not to be uh, uh, bringing bad news, uh, the U.S. economic expansion period we've been in uh, is now the third longest economic expansion in U.S. history. Uh, in the next few months, it's going to become the second longest. 
Um, so, so we have we, to be careful now. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's not going to last forever. And I think there are a lot of um, online lenders and a lot of uh, even payment companies that have been rewarded not necessarily for uh, making efficiency gains or developing better user experience or developing a better technology that drives costs down, which is a structural advantage, um, but rather have been rewarded so far for taking more risk. And uh, taking risk is, is a great way to build a business in a growing economy, but it goes, uh, it goes the other way pretty, pretty quickly. Interesting you, you speak about payment, because here you are more in the lending industry, but if you take the payment the last 10 years, we've seen companies in Europe valuated multiply by 100. I mean, I know some companies which have valuated now 25 billion. They were like under 500 million in 2005. So, can that be sustainable? If we speak of another business in, in Forex, are you seeing also the same kind of soft? Uh, yeah, you see the same thing. So initially, when a few companies come out, I believe ours was one of them initially, uh, we were almost from day one very profitable. Then you have lots of copycats who see how profitable it is. They all jump in, but they really don't have the technology or the expertise to really make a good business out of it. So they basically make their money by uh, cheating their customers, screwing their customers. Then it takes several years before the regulators start knowing, noticing that. The regulators then clamp down and slowly you see these companies uh, uh, fall away. And so a good example is in the United States. Ten years ago there were probably 30 Forex companies uh, servicing the retail market. Now it is down to two. And I think it's, it's, it's very good. The regulators did the right thing. These other companies that went under, they had nothing to offer. Uh, they only basically cheated their companies, uh, exploited the naive, and um, the only ones who survive are the ones that actually have technology to uh, be able to create something more efficient than the big players, and that's how you win. That leads me to a question of uh, one of the attendees, which is asking, how do you see the role of regulators in the fintech scene, friend or foe? You just give one of the answers. Uh, you know, from my company, the big friends, number one, we get to work with them. We get to tell them what we think, and, 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 and it's been a great synergy. Uh, number two, I don't like uh, when the other operators are, uh, um, you know, cheaters and, and scam artists, in my view. Uh, so, so um, yeah, I view them as a big friend, and, and they help clean up the market. And so it was only good for us. And whenever they come and clean up the market, our business goes up and uh, does much, much better. So we have only benefited from it. Same for you? Yeah, I think that anybody who sits on a stage or sits in their office and says that the regulator's a foe has a problem. <laughs> and they may not know it's a problem, but it's coming. Oh, you will have soon. <laughs> you will have. So in the US, we have the SEC, we have government regulation, and we also have state regulators. And so we have to work with those regulators in all the states we have investors and borrowers. And then when we have banks who buy loans from us or own equity in our companies, we have to work with their regulators, OCC, FTC, CFPB, FDIC, you get the idea. I can't tell you how important it is to be proactive with the regulators and tell your story. Don't let the incumbents tell your story, don't let your competitor tell your story, or you'll be boxed into something that you aren't. So I went to a regulator once in DC and one in New York and one in Philly, and a competitor or a bank told them that Prosper was something that it wasn't, that it was doing 200% loans or payday loans. And so I think it's important to not feel they're your enemy, but to really be proactive, tell your story, and respond when they ask you a question in the right way. So what with the regulator? You have we'll to work with, with them, absolutely. With them. Yeah, no, and I think the um, U.S. banking regulators have been doing a really good job at uh, sort of embracing innovation. I think that the CFPB, in particular, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, that was created a few years ago, uh, created a permanent office in San Francisco and um, had sort of uh, a uh, entire program called Project Catalyst that was really sort of designed to uh, listen to fintech startups and, and bring. Uh, the, uh, their feedback to, to Washington and, and sort of encourage innovation. Uh, the OCC has started a, an office on the, of innovation as well. So I think the yeah, US regulators have, have been doing a great job. And, and generally, I don't think, uh, so more regulation isn't the worst outcome. The worst outcome is regulatory uncertainty. It's like not knowing what the regulatory framework is. So from that standpoint, just to bridge this discussion with the last one, uh, I think starting a business now in fintech is easier because there is more regulatory certainty 
while in the sort of early years, there was really no good established regulatory framework in which we could yeah, operate. It's a bit harder to cope with, but at least you build something concrete uh, on, on string bad. Uh, please keep the microphone. Uh, we were discussing in preparing this panel about, say, what are doing the fintech, and in the at the beginning of the fintech era, they were always taking a vertical and trying to do it very well. So Michael, you explained you did Forex. Uh, you succeed quite a lot with uh, lending. And now we see more and more fintech news where um, many fintechs say, OK, I'm good in lending, let's begin payment. Or I'm good in payments, let's begin to lend money to the guy who are paying on the point of sale. Or why not doing also the current account? Or why not selling also an insurance to my cons consumer? So at the end of the day, it's like, many fintech having a very narrow field, they try to begin an universal bank, which is quite frightening because we thought the success of this fintech could be because they were focusing. So uh, what do you think on that? Because I know you have quite big opinion on that subject. So. Yeah, yeah. So we we've, we've seen um, in the early days what I called the uh, the debundling of the uh, sort of banking um, processes or bank banking services, with uh, as you said, so fintech companies focusing on one thing and, and trying to do that thing really well, whether it's payment or lending or wealth management or uh, sort of, um, uh, sort of financial services, financial uh, advisory. Um, and uh, I think in recent years we've seen uh, some fintech companies that have become large enough and have sufficient resources, but also acquired enough data to start something to start doing other things well. I think there are just a couple of examples. When you when you look at Square, I think they've been very successful in developing a payment processing business. But that payment processing business gave them a lot of data about uh, the small businesses they serve, and a lot more data than any small business lender ever had about about their um, their customers, and so they, they've been able to use that data to become a lender to these small businesses and, and do that really well. Um, so I think we, we are, we're seeing that happening, that sort of data synergy happening with other parts of fintech that create that, that rebundling. Uh, so just to give a plug to my own company, Upgrade. Shirt. Um, you are in big ear. Make, make it sure you like that. You know? Good. good. Um, so it's it's really also a data play because we've um, uh, in the U.S. you've seen a lot of uh, providers of credit monitoring and credit education services on one side, and then banks and lenders on the other side. And um, there's a lot of sort of data inefficiency in having these two services provided by different companies, and all your data. Uh, essentially being in one place or the other, but, but really the, the, the uh, financial uh, advice you're getting, not benefiting from everything the lender knows about you, and the lender not benefiting from trending data um, that the uh, sort of credit monitoring company might have about you when, when the lender has the underwriting. Uh, so having both set of services under one roof really creates a lot of data efficiency. At the end of the day, can help consumers get better advice and uh, get better price pricing on the financial services we get. Please run. So I think there's two words that come up all the time in pitches from companies to venture capitalists and private equity, and that's lifetime value and cross-selling. And so you see entrepreneurs all the time talk about the cost of acquisition. It could be a student, a consumer, a mortgage, a Forex client. What is the cost to get them and what's the value over time? And if you created another product, could you cross sell that second or third thing to that first person? And then can you then geographically expand? So in North America or in America, we see lots of expansion to Canada or Australia and sometimes Mexico where the cultural language and data is somewhat similar. And we also see it here in Singapore, where entrepreneurs tell you, assure you, or try to expand into Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and some of the other geographic areas here, when they actually don't understand the regulatory, cultural, other issues of that expansion. And so I think it's a sign when you see a company tell you they're doing a second or third product or a geographic expansion, is that a strength or is that an indication of weakness that their own core product, that their own thing that they do so well, isn't quite as well as they say. Ma Ma Michael, 20 years plus O&I exists and still one very narrow product, Forex. 
you don't do trading of shares or whatever. So it was a, a real choice. You did all the year long. Yeah, I'm a firm believer for a startup. It's very important. You have to be very narrow. You have to be very focused. You have to stay on it all the time. And if you start going into other verticals uh, without first becoming the very best in the world at what you are doing, then you're fooling yourself and you have no chance of success. If you are middle of the road in a lot of different products, you're not going to survive. You have to be number one at something and be the best in the world. And once you achieve that, then yes, I can see that you sometimes go over into other verticals, but oftentimes, you know, your, your, your uh, uh, um, experience is different with Square, the example you brave, but lots of companies, if you look at Facebook and Google, how many times they fail when they try to go into other businesses? It's very, very difficult and it's easy to say, I would always recommend stay on just one thing and figure out how to become the best in the world in that, and then you will win. So you think even in the today's environment of funding, because you were speaking of VCs, that's important for fintech to find new rounds of money. And the VCs, they would like sometimes you to come back and say, hey, I'm selling another product, I'm doing cross-selling. So chicken and eggs, they need more money and they need to please the VC. Do you think today, with the need for money and so on, they can continue to say, I'm focusing on that? They should, in your opinion, focus only on one? I would just focus on one. I know the VCs put pressure on to do multiple different things, and you're always supposed to bring up your earnings and bring in additional revenue screens. But it's, in my experience, it's much, much harder than it appears, and you're better off figuring out how to get more out of what you are doing. As we are with you, Michael, um, I, I know you have uh, some opinion about the, the role of technology and regulation and the transparency in the market, being in whatever fintech industry, but in Forex in particular. Uh, by the way, we have a very bad sound. I don't know if it's for you, but if someone in behind can look at that. Um, so can you, can you tell us what you think about the role of the technology and regulator uh, on transparency in the, uh, in the fintech market? Yeah, if you talk about financial markets in general, um, uh, my personal view is uh, the more transparent and the more information that is out there, the better the market, the more efficient the market, and the fairer it is to consumers. And I think regulators there could play an additional role by, by forcing some of that transparency. So, for example, in Forex, everything is an over-the-counter, mostly an over-the-counter market. And so, therefore, the public doesn't see necessarily what the prices are that get ex executed. Now, every forex uh, uh, company in the United States or in Canada has to upload their transactions to the regulator, so the regulator knows. But in my view, the regulator should push it a little bit further and have it go out to the public in real time, force every exchange, every uh, financial company that does trading to make that information transparent because then it opens up the markets, the information is there, people can do price discovery much better, and it's better for the end consumer. Okay, and, and in your opinion, for the same question, transparency, in the lending industry, do we have this transparency in the market? Can I compare two marketplaces with some KPIs which are similar, or it's not really possible? So I think the question really is about trust. And how do you get trust of a borrower or a lender or a seller or a buyer or somebody in a marketplace or any two-sided market? And so, yes, transparency is critical in the establishment of trust. So I could argue that sometimes too much transparency is a big, big problem also. Ten years ago, there was an online lender in America who was too transparent. The borrowers put their picture on the internet and they wrote a story of a thousand words or less. Their religion, their gender, the cat, the car, and their belief in why they needed the money. And this clearly wasn't the right way to do it. And the investors could communicate with each other to negotiate with each other against the borrower. And so I could argue that too much transparency isn't good either. But the need to establish trust goes back to transparency. So as long as it's the right amount and the right style, we're too much transparency on one side of a market. So you have to have the same amount on the buyer side as the seller side as well. But it, it's not just everything has to be transparent. I'm all about building transparency. There are online lenders who give 500 pieces of information about each of the borrowers. But the problem is some of the competitors will try to back into that data and figure out the secret sauce of the credit model. How do they do price and credit risk and underwriting? 
And so when you're transparent and you give all five digits or nine digits of a zip code or some other code, sometimes you have to remove one or two digits or scramble half so that you're not too transparent that there's adverse selection or a problem with the borrower or a lender. So it can't be too much, but there does need to be a lot. You want to add something on that? Well, yeah, I think what's great about transparency is uh, sort of not enough, sort of not only providing the data, but uh, soon enough when there's sort of enough data in the market and, and when there's an agreement between the main platforms that um, so we should put that data out, uh, then you start uh, seeing the creation of an ecosystem of um, sort of analytics firms that get formed and help investors or partners um, consume the data and make sense of the data. So in online lending in the US, for, for a few years, you had sort of Lending Club and Prosper really putting a lot of data out, uh, but not a, there wasn't a lot of capabilities from the other side to analyze that data. And then you, you started to see um, firms like PIQ, like DV01, like Orchard, um, becoming sort of essentially analytics, analytics firms uh, and providing sort of dashboard and, and reporting to investors. And that, in turn, helps uh, the industry mature. It helps uh, encourage the sort of securitization market. Uh, maybe that will lead to the creation of a secondary market at some point. Uh, so I think the transparency is not just a, so you have the data, that's great, but also uh, that encourages other players to form an ecosystem and develop all the capabilities that you need to make sense of the data and, and really make the entire industry more efficient. Keep, keep the microphone. We'll do a break of a few minutes on the question of the public. So uh, we have a lot of lovers of cryptocurrency and, and blockchain there. So as you were speaking of transparency, could be also a point. So I read the question. I think you could answer, and I'm sure Ron will have an opinion. Uh, with advent of cryptocurrencies and blockchain, do you think cross-border P2P lending business model has a chance to succeed as a new type of marketplace lending? If you don't understand my English, you have that here. <laughs> So I think that it's a lot of conversation and not a lot of action and activity yet when we talk about cryptocurrency. What I do think is close or closer than the currency itself is the digital contracts. So the whole concept of using Ethereum as the way to have an agreement between a borrower and a lender or a buyer or a seller. And so I think we'll see digital contracts coming first before we see the actual use of currencies. And so you're starting to see bands or businesses use crypto contracts and Ethereum type contracts instead of paper, instead of lawyers, that does all of the agreements and all the payments. So I think that will come before using an actual cryptocurrency in the online lending world. Opinion on that? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. And the problem with cryptocurrencies is, I mean, the most well-known is Bitcoin and is pretty much stopped being a currency. Uh, it became a commodity because, because the price has appreciated so much that nobody's really using it as a currency anymore. Um, but, but, but I think the, what's been remarkable uh, and what we're starting to take advantage of uh, at Upgrade is um, really the underlying technology and the, the blockchain protocol. Uh, so for example, we are uh, now using the blockchain protocol to um, essentially create a time-stamped immutable record of every transaction. So every piece of agreement signed by a borrower can be sort of committed to a public blockchain every 10 minutes, and that creates that uh, sort of immutable record of that transaction. It's a very um, efficient, technology-enabled, and, and highly automated way uh, to uh, sort of keep track of every transaction and create that immutable record. Sorry, I continue with a few questions of the public and keep the microphone. This one was for you when you were speaking. Um, uh, what is one piece of advice uh, you, you would have for um, entrepreneurs who are afraid to get out there? Uh, you were speaking before about to be careful of the growth and so on. So perhaps one was afraid, I don't know. So do you have a piece of advice for some fintech entrepreneur in the room that would like to, to get out? Um, if any, perhaps you don't. <laughs> I don't know if I understand what get out there means. <laughs> launching, I'm sure, I, I assume, means no, I launching the business. And I get it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, do it and, and fail. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? You, you'll fail and, and then, yeah, you do it again. Um, I think it's, um, I mean, we're, we're really 
blessed, as, as Ron said before, uh, I think a lot of the sort of um, uh, entrepreneurship spirit now is becoming global. And by under, under entrepreneurship spirit, I mean um, really the, the quest for innovation and the desire to make the world better through better technology, better processes, better products that haven't been invented yet. And, uh, and also the, I think the permission to fail and make mistakes. Uh, I think you, you can't ask someone to do something that's never been done before and uh, expect uh, that person to get it right all the time. So I think innovation means uh, having the right to make mistakes and the right to fail. Um, and, uh, and I think that that particular uh, ID uh, gets tricky in fintech because with fintech you're dealing with people's money and failing or making mistakes can have uh, sort of big consequences and it's generally regulated and again it's regulated for good reason. Um, so, so, so I think they, uh, they, there needs to be some control mechanism and some balance between the desire to innovate and the right to fail and the fact that it is financial services and, and you need to have the, sort of the, the discipline and the analytical rigor and, and the risk management framework to uh, make sure that a failure doesn't necessarily trigger a, a big loss uh, for your customers. I think just to underline what you were just saying, and we will move on on that, is for any fintech entrepreneur who was there, even if this three are very successful, it was not always up. So you had your own up and down, I may assume. All of you. I, so. I, I think the other thing to, to, to offer encouragement for somebody who wants to take the jump out, um, it's important to observe that a lot of people, their company later on, where they are successful was not what they planned, it's something they planned. They tried to go and do something and then depending on the reactions and what they learned, they decided to take various curves. And it could turn out to be quite different. In our company, we had no intention of going out and do trading. That was sort of something we came up with much later. We were initially just an information site. And I think a lot of companies are like that. They, they, they start out by doing something, but then end up being successful doing something completely different. So you don't have to have the perfect idea before you launch. Just be willing, you have to be willing to work like a maniac 24 <laughs> hours a day, eight days a week, and uh, then you will be successful. And to be agile. Yeah, I would agree. I think the need to pivot is something that early entrepreneurs don't understand or comprehend. Everybody goes through it. I get this question a lot from people who are about to have children for the first time or entrepreneurs for that piece of advice. And I tell them both to get some rest because as an entrepreneur, you will sleep just like a baby. You will get up every two hours and you will cry. <laughs> I think the thing that entrepreneurs don't understand is on those up days, like a roller coaster, when it's going up, you can't imagine it's going to go down. And then on that day that it's going down, you can't imagine it's going to go up. And sometimes that can happen in the very same day. I also think being an entrepreneur at times can be lonely. There's only so many things as a CEO you can talk to, to your leadership team, to your board, to your investors. And so be prepared for that loneliness that many entrepreneurs have. So pick the right people that you work with, pick the investors and the board, because there are some very, very great board meetings and some not so great ones. And it's at those moments when things are really good or not so good that you realize who your partners are and where there's really alignment as an entrepreneur. Staying in the advice for entrepreneurship, uh, one of the questions that attendees ask, and I think, Michael, as you work uh, as a teacher and a professor and also with corporation and fintech, perhaps we can begin with you. Um, uh, what, what do you see as uh, the interest and how can we work um, with incumbents as a fintech, fintech entrepreneur working with established bank, working with established incumbents? Do you think it's good, bad, we have to be careful, it's a good way of cooperation to build something? I'm a bit broading on the question, but the question basically is that. It's god awful. Um, no, I have to say um, um, we were very lucky because when we got into trading, we needed liquidity. And there was only one bank that came out of nowhere, UBS, and they gave us liquidity. And um, I don't know what happened to them. They must have been very drunk because any <laughs> rational uh, uh, look at our company, they should not have given us liquidity, but they did, and it made us uh, uh, survive. And, and so 
um, we benefited uh, from, from, from uh, incumbents. At the same time, then when we sold our technology to the incumbents, they were god-awful to work with. They are so conservative. They have so many rules in place. Uh, they are so not agile. Um, it's, it, it was very, very difficult. So I have very mixed reaction as to uh, how it is to work with uh, incumbents. Well, I think in, in, um, in online lending in the U.S., we, we've developed really great partnerships with banks uh, that, that work with platforms in real symbiosis um, with sort of each partner really focusing on what they do best. Um, so we, if you think of uh, the cost of credit as a combination of the cost of capital and the cost of operations, uh, really the banks have the lowest cost of capital. Um, and the sort of online lenders have very low cost of operations, uh, powered by technology and, and modern processes, and, and the absence of, uh, sort of legacy cost. Uh, so when you put these two together, and uh, the banks provide the capital, but the online platforms uh, provide the experience and really the, the last mile to the customer, and and uh, sort of all these sort of data and analytics. Uh, that goes into the underwriting and, and, and the servicing operations, you really get the, the best of both worlds that eventually helps drive down the, the cost of credit uh, for, for consumers and businesses. Yeah, I think that any entrepreneur that thinks that they don't have to or will not have to deal with incumbents, it could be an incumbent telecom company, insurance company, tech company, bank, you name it, they're fooling themselves. You have to. I've been part of a team that sold 100% of a company to an incumbent bank. I've been part of a team who sold a portion of a company to an incumbent bank and done debt deals with incumbent banks and other groups in financial inclusion and lending and payments and others. You've got to get used to it and you've got to get ready. It is awful sometimes, but it is also required. And I think you need to understand what it means to be a vendor or have a vendor that's a bank. Understand their regulators and their issues. No. They're not as agile as we are as entrepreneurs and fintech business people. They have a lot of innovation, but they have more lawyers than we do. They have the same data. They may not do the same thing with the data, but you're kidding yourself if you don't think you need to work with the incumbents sooner or later. Speaking of banks, uh, another question of the attendees is, um, how do you see the bank's business model getting affected by fintech? Which customer segments or earnings are threatened today? Do you have an opinion on that? So one of the CEOs of one of the top three banks in America asked me to come talk to him for 80 minutes and explain the truth, to be candid and be open because he didn't think he was getting the truth from his leadership team, from his bankers, and his innovation team. And I sat in front of this very wealthy guy, this very smart guy, and I asked him if he could handle the truth because I was going to tell it. And I told him, and I told him how hard it was to work with this bank that there were actually not one bank, there was one brand and one business card, but there were four warring groups within the bank, each with its own technology, its own data, its own politics, its own empires, and they weren't really working together, and there were people who were trying to make it work, and then there was this innovation group that would come out and see us, they'd go back and tell the bank what they thought, and then they'd be gone nine months later. And so I think it's really important. These banks have five to 10 years to get it right to get their culture right, to get their execution right, the technology and infrastructure right. Vikram Pandit talked about it a little bit this morning, that the banks are in control. They have the lowest cost of capital, they have relationships with lots of the money, that they have a chance to really become thousand year companies and trillion dollar companies, but they don't have forever to figure it out. And these CEOs know it. If you look in America at Goldman Sachs, they started something called Marcus. They built a $2 billion loan origination system that's doing well. They thought about going into the real estate lending market, saw how hard it was, and went out and bought Genesis last month. The other banks and investment banks in every board meeting and every strategy meeting are pounding the table saying, what are we doing? Are we buying, building, joint venturing, merging? The time is now, the golden era for all of us, FinTech and the banks to figure it out is right now, which what, is what makes it so exciting. Yeah, but so your point is banks have, let's say, five to ten years to react, but you didn't answer to, is there any specific segment for you, it's all the segment could be attacked, 
Or is there a specific segment where fintech should focus today, uh, uh, let's say because there is a gap in the bank industry or pricing gap or whatever? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think uh, banks are so inefficient at almost everything they do, any area is open for uh, disruption. It's not easy to disrupt, but any... So it's thank you to so Singapore Bank Association for inviting us. <laughs> so it was a nice dinner. Please welcome us again. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, I, I once was invited to a brainstorming session with a board member group at a big European bank. And they fully recognized, I agree with you, they recognized that their time was limited. And the way they looked at it is they said, we are a fantastic, we're a gigantic steam engine that works very well as a steam engine. But the modern technology are little electromotors. And so what we have to do is transform our business from a steam engine to thousands of little elect electromotors. And how do we do that? And they came to the conclusion, you can't. There's too many politics going on within the thing. It's just you cannot transform a steam engine to electromotors. So their plan was to build up a brand new bank from a clean sheet of paper consisting just of these little electromotors, very startup oriented type of thing. Let that grow and once that becomes big enough then you simply turn off the supply of energy to that steam engine and let it die off. And that's the only way they can... That's the banks that came to this conclusion. Now. They did that just before the financial crisis, and then the financial crisis ruined everything, and they never went anywhere with their plans. But they recognize these things, and but they find it very difficult to switch. And I don't know what banks are internally thinking right now, but I think that's a big problem they have. How do you transform yourself from a dinosaur to something small and nimble? Do you want to react on that? Yeah, no, I, I think the, the key to all this, as, as is always the key for any uh, successful business venture, is people. Um, so how do you get the best people, right? If you're, if you're at a bank, how do you get the most innovative, entrepreneurial um, people who are going to sort of feel that they have the opportunity uh, and the, the opportunity to take risk and to innovate and the authorization to make mistakes? Uh, because the banks have, uh, they have more customers, they have more resources, more data, uh, and a lower, lower cost of capital than any fintech company. I think what they are missing uh, sometimes is that culture of innovation and again that permission to uh, take risk and, and, and make mistakes. And I think that also explains uh, the success of the online ventures of Goldman Sachs because that's one of the banks that have the most access to talent in the US. So we have just a few minutes left, and you just mentioned uh, one minute ago the golden era you think we are, and it's true that when we prepare this panel, you are very exciting about uh, fintech. I think you go in 80 countries uh, a year just to say, hey, build fintechs. So what makes you so exciting besides uh, the fact you think banks uh, have only 10 years, but I'm, I'm sure you have other arguments on, uh, on the subject? Yeah, so I'm in four countries this week talking about the golden era of fintech that we are in today on the globe in every country. And so every innovation cycle is a 50-year cycle. Transportation, lodging, television, internet. It takes 50 years for a full cycle to happen. In the US, if you look at fintech, financial technology, and again, we were all talking earlier, you could argue it started in the mid-90s with the online electric, electronic trading companies, E-Trade and others. You could also argue it started in the late 90s with PayPal, who really changed the way we moved money and paid for things. And then this guy in 2005 and 6 created Lending Club. And he actually gave people in America, for the very first time, a reason to come to the internet to borrow and lend. It was never done before. It's the same thing as eBay and AOL gave people the reason to come to the internet to use eBay for the buying and selling marketplace and AOL to share things, share weather, share pictures. And so we're now 20 years into the 50 year cycle. We're in the middle period, the golden era. And you see Amazon, Alibaba, Facebook, all these big companies and the incumbents determining they also want to be in this innovation cycle. Square, PayPal, look at the market capitalization. I think PayPal's bigger than American Express. And so the truth is, we don't really know who's gonna win, where the winners will be in this golden era. 
But if you don't know where you stand today, you have no chance of winning in this period. It will be quick. In fact, I don't think we actually know all the winners who will be in this cycle. And then as the middle cycle, that 10-year period ends, the winners clean up the whole thing at the end. And you will see the exit of many companies in lending, in technology, lose completely. You're seeing it in retail with Kmart and Sears and lots of places. They lost the retail innovation cycle. They missed it. And so you see Walmart and these other incumbents scrambling to deal with what's happening with retail. So for me, this creates tremendous excitement to be in the fintech era, in the online era, both as an investor, as an operator, an advisor. I think that the big money is ahead of us. The big money is going to be made over the next 10 years. And that excites me, including the talent coming to this era of fintech innovation. I think it's a good conclusion word for this founders panel. So thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for coming.